November 26, 1943, the skies over Germany. Aircraft from the US Army Air Force's 56th Fighter Group climbed towards a formation of Boeing B-17 flying fortresses returning from a bombing run on the heavily industrialized German city of Bremen. The lumbering fortresses are sitting ducks, the Nazi fighters now swarming around them, and it's up to the airmen, like Major Stanley Gabby Gabreski, to distract them long enough to allow the B-17s to slip through and make it home. From the cockpit of the hulking warbird, Gabretsky eases the throttle forward. Fuel pours into the big radial engine's 18 cylinders, sending more than 2,000 horsepower coursing through the drive shaft to the massive four bladed propeller chopping through the thin air. Leering through his canopy, Gabreski is overwhelmed. The sky is so full of enemy fighters that he's having trouble deciding which one to engage first. Then a twin engine Messerschmitt BF 110 appears 700 yards out and the decision becomes clearer. Maneuvering into position and squeezing the stick-mounted trigger, the 850 caliber Brownings in the wings snarl to life, unleashing a hail of bullets that slam into their target. Barely avoiding huge chunks of aluminium flying off the 110, Gabreski watches the mangled plane plummet towards the earth as another enemy aircraft flies through his gun sights. Already throttled up, he pounces, and he fires. Moments later, succumbing to heavy damage sustained between its wing and fuselage, it too spirals downward in a dramatic barbell. With his fourth and fifth kills in the books, Gabreski is now officially an ace. The 25-year-old Pennsylvanian will go on to shoot down more than two dozen enemy aircraft, but he isn't the first to record a confirmed kill in a Republic P-47 Thunderbolt. That honor goes to Don Blakesley, who downed a Fokker Wolf FW-190 a few months earlier. Blakesley would end up with 15 victories, but what makes Gabreski's kills so special is that they were all made from the cockpit of a Republic P-47, one of the fastest, toughest, and most effective high-altitude fighters and ground attack aircraft of the Second World War. And in today's video, we're going to get into all about it. Development of what would become the P-47 got underway in the late 1930s when Long Island, New York-based ProPublic Aviation began designing and building a number of demonstrators to test new concepts and new engines. Early prototypes were stockier and less powerful than later production models, but with empty weights around 10,000 pounds, that's about 4,500 kilos, and a maximum takeoff weight approaching 18,000 pounds, or just a little above 8,100 kilograms, the planes were absolute beer moths. By comparison, North American P-51 Mustangs and Supermarine Spitfires had maximum takeoff weights that were between 30 and 50% lighter than the P-47s. Designated the XP-47, the U.S. Army Air Corps, the predecessor of the U.S. Army Air Forces, backed the project. But by the spring of 1940, it was evident that the 47 wouldn't match up well against the Luftwaffe's fighters. Both the Messerschmitt BF-109, which entered service in 1937, and the Fokker-Wulf FW-190, which was nearing the final stages of development, were superior in a number of critical areas. Each had a better power-to-weight ratio, was more agile, and could climb better at low and medium altitudes. In addition, XP-47s and early production models featured canopies that were partially embedded in the rear of the fuselage. The forward end of the tail assembly extended over the rear portion of the cockpit, which added strength to the airframe and allowed for more space for fuel, but it meant the pilots couldn't see what was behind them, a huge drawback in an aircraft that would ultimately be tasked with tangling with some of the world's best fighters. With so many shortcomings, the P-47's future was far from certain. Rublik addressed many of these issues, but the plane was still plagued by its weight and insufficient power, though each was eventually overcome with the addition of a turbo-supercharged Pratt & Whitney R2800 double WASP 18-cylinder radial engine and a massive four-bladed propeller that measured nearly 12 feet, 3.7 meters, from tip to tip. The supercharger system was complex, and it presented a number of engineering challenges because it took up tons of space that would have otherwise been used for undercarriage components and fuel tanks, and it made the already bulky airplane about as aerodynamic as 
well, a brick. On the other hand, it produced enormous power, which allowed P-47s to operate efficiently at very high altitudes, something many of its contemporaries simply couldn't do. In fact, the P-47's engine was capable of producing maximum power even in the thin air at 27,000 feet, where normally aspirated, non-supercharged engines became oxygen-starved and lost power by the boatload. Now with a power plant potent enough to compensate for its heft, the new machine was finally shaping up. It was also taking on its iconic form, thanks largely to its ovular cowling, which allowed the air-cooled engine and oil coolers to remain at normal operating temperatures, even at full throttle when the turbo supercharger was spinning at nearly 22,000 RPM. Armament came from eight 50 caliber Browning machine guns split between the wings that together could spew out nearly 100 rounds per second. Designated the XP-47B, the impressive fighter first flew in early May 1941 with only minor mechanical issues. Though multiple prototypes were lost during the testing, the XP-47B achieved 412 miles per hour, 663 kilometers an hour in level flight, and later production models would be even faster. Sufficiently impressed, the US Army Air Forces ordered more than 170 units, but the first combat missions in the European and Pacific theaters wouldn't take place until 1943. Now, though they had absolutely gobs of firepower, superior endurance, and performed well at high altitude, tactics were as responsible for the P-47's successes as the machine itself. In fact, some pilots considered their Thunderbolts mechanically inferior to the aircraft they faced nearly every day, and they weren't shy about voicing their opinions. P-47s were ultimately referred to as jugs because they resembled glass milk bottles of the day, and flying bathtubs because of their sheer bulk. But though they weren't great climbers, P-47s had unmatched dive performance. In fact, with their noses down, they could reach nearly 550 miles per hour, 890 kilometers an hour, and many pilots used this advantage to shake threatening enemy fighters from their tails. Don Blakesley famously said of the P-47, it ought to be able to dive because it certainly can't climb. German pilots learned to avoid diving away from thunderbolts, instead relying on tight turns and quick climbs. Due to their weight and their lack of maneuverability, these actions often resulted in thunderbolts overshooting their adversaries, after which the hunter became the hunted. Even English aviators from the British Eagle Squadron, who'd previously flown light and nimble Spitfire Mark Vs, got in on the action, claiming that all a pilot had to do to defend himself from more agile German fighters was to run around to the far side of the cockpit and hunker down until the firing stopped. Though meant as a tongue-in-cheek slight against the Thunderbolt's size, it was really a testament to the plane's unmatched ability to sustain heavy damage and just keep on flying. Despite its rugged design, however, low-altitude climb rate was always a constant concern for pilots. But with the addition of the Curtis paddle blade propeller, the playing field became a whole lot more level. Early versions had only moderate operational ranges, but upgrades meant that the P-47s were eventually able to accompany British and American bombers all the way to Germany and back, thanks largely to external drop tanks. Later, P-47Ds also got bubble canopies, which gave pilots improved all-round vision, and its air-cooled engine was capable of sustaining much more damage than aircraft with water-cooled power plants, which were particularly susceptible to being knocked out. Despite their drawbacks, with skilled pilots at the helm, P-47s were natural long-range escorts and fighters. Of 750,000 sorties flown, they downed more than 3,700 enemy aircraft of all types, and they were standouts at attacking ground targets as well. On the way home from escort duties, when they had ample fuel and ammo left over, Thunderbolts were often allowed to peel away and strafe ground targets like airfields, factories, trains, and tanks. In fact, P-47 performed so well in this role that many ultimately became dedicated to just doing that. Capable of carrying up to 2,000 pounds, 907 kilograms of bombs, some were also fitted with high-explosive M8 and M10 rockets that were capable of punching through the thick armor of King Tiger tanks and Yag Tiger tank destroyers. In conjunction with their heavy machine guns, these armaments gave P-47 the most firepower of any American single-engine fighter of the war. It's estimated that between D-Day and VE Day, P-47s destroyed more than 90,000 railcars and locomotives, 6,000 armored vehicles like tanks and half-trucks, and approximately 60,000 trucks. In one instance during Operation Cobra in the summer of 1944, P-47s from the 405th Fighter Group knocked out more than 120 tanks, 250 trucks, and nearly a dozen artillery pieces in just a few days. Yeah. 
Though P-47s cemented their status as fighters, escorts, and ground attack aircraft, by mid-1944, there were newer, faster, and far more lethal German planes with which they'd need to contend namely the ME-262s. Powered by twin turbojets with top speeds approaching 550 miles per hour or 885 kilometers an hour, the Luftwaffe's new wonder weapons were just in a class of their own. To combat this new threat, Republic Aviation earmarked a few new P-47Ds on its New York production line for upgrades, the most notable of which was a tweaked engine capable of generating nearly 3,000 horsepower. Though still not as fast as the 262s, the new Thunderbolts could achieve maximum speeds of approximately 470 miles per hour, that's 756 kilometers an hour, and climb much more rapidly. On March the 25th, American pilots Major George Bastwick and Edwin Crossway shot down two ME-262s gliding in for landings at Parcham Airfield in northeast Germany. This was a common tactic among P-47M, as jets were particularly vulnerable during takeoffs and landings, but Thunderbolt pilots scored a number of conventional kills as well. Over Germany in early April of 1944, a single ME-262 slashed into a formation of B-17s at over 500 miles per hour, 804 kilometers an hour, blasting one from the sky with a long burst from its 430mm cannons. Jettisoning their drop tanks, two Thunderbolts gave chase, and though he could have outrun his pursuers, the Luftwaffe pilot made the error of attempting to outrun them. Moments later, Captain John C. Faringer unleashed his Brownings from 500 yards. Smoke immediately began bellowing from the stricken jet, and the pilot ejected as Faringer flew by. In the skies over Europe, P-47s downed 20 Messerschmitt Me-262 jet fighters and at least four Arado AR-234 jet bombers. All told, more than 50,000 Thunderbolts were built, making it the most produced U.S. fighter of the Second World War. By war's end, the 8th Air Force's 56th Fighter Group was the only unit still flying P-47s by choice, though they'd been offered newer P-51s. Nearly 3,500 were lost in combat, but pilots in P-47s were credited with more than 3,700 air-to-air kills. With the cessation of hostilities, orders for nearly 6,000 additional aircraft were immediately cancelled. Thunderbolts continued to actively serve with the U.S. Army Air Forces in until 1947, until 1949 with Air National Guard units around the country, and to spotter planes working in conjunction with maritime patrol and rescue aircraft like OA-10 Catalina flying boats. Though the dawn of the jet age had arrived, previously mothballed P-47s were once again pressed into service as trainers for pilots making the jump from piston aircraft to new jets like the F-84 Thunderjets, which made its debut in the early 1950s. Piston and propeller planes like the P-51 Mustangs fought in the Korean conflict as ground attack aircraft, but many pilots, especially veterans of World War II, suggested that they'd have been better off with their old jugs because they were faster, tougher, and could carry much larger weapons loads. Now, dozens of perfectly restored P-47s bide their time in aviation museums around the world, and some still do fly regularly. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, if you've got a suggestion for a future video, please do leave it in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching.